Excellent. Right, so um, after the big boxes and lasers, um, I'm going to talk about smaller boxes and um, about what we have been doing for Right Atlas and what we are still doing in Right Atlas space. I'm assuming that all of you know what Right Atlas is, I'm not going to go into the details. But for those of you who don't, um, it's just a big, big, big measurement network with more than 8,000 devices. Um, you can collaborate in it, you can uh, run your own measurement if you're running your own uh, right atlas um, code. Basically, that's what it is. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about, um, some more APIs and UIs, uh, new features, and I'm also going to give you um, an outlook about what we are doing in the first slide. That's great. That's so great, actually. <laughs> Um, so again, I'll try. Okay. Uh, okay. So, first of all, network growth. Um, somewhere in March or April uh, this year, we reached. Uh, yes. Okay. I will do that. So that's a natural loss, but compared to what we had more than three years ago, uh, we have only lost like, I don't know, three, four, five percent or so of those. Uh, there's a somewhat bigger loss with version twos, and um, we still don't exactly know what the loss is going to be with version threes because we are still seeding the system. But this is going to be interesting. Um, most likely, the explanation is that um, the people who are really, really committed have already engaged with the project. So nowadays when we approach someone or someone approaches us and say, I heard about this thing, um, give me a device please. Um, we give them a device and the chances that that device actually will come online are somewhat lower. Or it will stay online, it's somewhat lower. Um, on the positive side, we have revamped the, the so-called Pro UI, so if you're looking for what pros are available in a particular country, in a region, in an AES, in a prefix, you can just go there, you can search for anything uh, that we have uh, and that people contributed. So we also expose these to APIs and can actually know what the network extent is. Um, we have also revamped the measurement UI now, it's actually way easier to use, and that's something that I would like to show you. Um, so this is, just to, to flesh it out, um, this is basically the, the, the new UI, and if I say I want to do a ping measurement to one, two, three, four, then the system kind of guides me in what I can do. I can say, no, I don't want 50 probes from all over the world, but instead I want to use a country which is called Finland or Fiji. That's even better. And give me 30 probes from that country. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, I want to do a single one-off measurement instead of a recurring, a periodic one, and so on and so forth. So the system also tells me that this is going to cost this many credits and so on and so forth. Um, what's interesting, and the reason why I'm really showing this, is because uh, we have seen that many people struggle with the automation of such a system. So they actually want to do measurements, but they don't want to go through the UI. So they have to learn how to do it, how to specify a measurement, and the rest of the API and all the flags and parameters and so on. So we got rid of that problem by having this section here. So once you specify a measurement uh, in the UI, the whole system just gives you an API compatible query. So you can just use WGET or curl or whatever your favorite 
uh, client is, submit this to the system, and the system will just make a measurement. So you no longer have to exactly know what the parameters are. The only thing you need to do is like replace uh, the target IP if you want to do uh, multiple measurements. So if you want to measure your own network, by all means, this is an easy way to do that. Okay, we have um, APIs, a lot of them actually. Uh, you can interact with the system, you can create your measurements, you can query for measurements, you can stop your measurements, you can do whatever you want with them. You can also download the results, which is basically the point for the whole Atlas system, uh, using a programmable interface if you want to. We have status checks, which is a, a, at the moment is quite an underused feature, and I would like to highlight that. So if, for example, you are scheduling a measurement to ping your own network from all over the world, you can define whether that's from 10 vantage points or 100. Um, then you can go to this particular feature. The status checks basically tell you if, according to the history of that measurement, everything is still okay or not. So <clears throat> just to explain a bit more, basically we maintain a history of RTTs towards your network, towards the target, from all the probes, and if there are wide deviations or packet loss compared to what it was before, then we raise a flag, and you can just check that flag. You don't have to do any calculations, which is Get the URL, and what you get back is a boolean: is it okay or is it not? Um, we also have a Zynga or Navios plugin, so you can actually just plug that into your network, um, meaning basically you don't have to do anything but do the measurement, plug it into Mac in your Navios, and Navios will warn you if something is wrong. That's actually a pretty cool feature. Um, you can also interact with the probes, so you can um, download what were a set of probes active, I don't know, a year ago. If you want to do some historical research, that's fine. Result streaming, I will um, talk a bit more about that, but basically that's real-time access to the data um, and a whole lot more APIs over here. But this is an interesting one. Uh, so we have introduced so-called user tags um, a long time ago. So you could say that my probe is at home, my probe is at my IXP, my probe is blue. You can say whatever you want. Um, and this information is goes through the APIs. So if someone wants to measure something from home probes or quite the opposite, from non-home probes, they can now do that um, through the measurement API. So they can say, give me 100 probes from Finland as long as they are in data centers. So that's, that's something. Um, we have also introduced uh, so-called system tags. So the system itself looks at some properties and tries to, to tag probes automatically with this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's readable or... Yeah, it's actually working. Great. So um, this particular probe was tagged by the user as, I think it's on the DSL line, it's home, it uses NAT, it has native IPv6, and the user also wants BCP38 testing. That's great. Um, but the system itself tagged this as, this is a version 1 probe, it, you know, DNS A resolution works well, DNS quad A resolution works well, IPv4 works, IPv6 works, IPv4 capability is okay, and it uses um, RFC 19 to express. So these are tags that we automatically assign to probes, and if you want to say, measure my thing, but don't use native probes, you can then tell the system, use probes, except that they should not be tagged with RFC 1980. For example, if that's what you want to do, you can do that. Okay. New measurement types. Um, NTP measurements, if you want to do that, now it's available actually, so this slide is somewhat outdated in that sense. Um, basically, you can query any NTP server you like and uh, it will give you the results of what the probe saw from that. Um, we are planning to do Wi Fi measurements. This is most likely going to be done with a new generation of probes, so the current probes will not suddenly do Wi Fi. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, but the idea here is that assuming that the, the Atlas probe works, it's, it's functioning already, uh, and it is possible to schedule a measurement on it to say, turn on the Wi-Fi, try to connect to a particular network, do a ping, do a trace route, and then shut down the Wi-Fi to give you the results. Uh, a particular use case is Eduron, uh, and those are the guys who are really pushing for this, they are very, very interested, um, because they, for example, want to verify whether Eduron actually works in remote locations where the local host claims that it actually works. It may work, you know, the SSID may exist, the authentication may or may not work, uh, but even if you could authenticate, maybe the, the network itself just doesn't work really well. So this is will give them a, a chance to, to do ad hoc testing as well as peer ones. Um, HTTP checks, we are going to enable this against right address anchors, um, not any, against any random targets because that's a, a privacy question. Um, so this is coming in a 
next couple of months. And the TLS, uh, looking at the, the amount of problems nowadays discovered with TLS and SSL implementations, it seems like a good idea to, to be able to discover what kind of cipher protocol suits are supported in, in particular destinations. Okay, um, result streams. So this is basically drinking from a fire hose, if you will. As soon as we get the data, if you are interested, you can also get the data, like with absolutely no delay. What you need to do for this is you need to use a um, sort of WebSockets compatible client. Um, this is a standard technology, so it's, it's not really a problem nowadays. It's supported in all the browsers. Um, and you can just say, give me all the results as soon as they come in about measurement one, two, three. Um, that could be your measurement, that could be someone else's measurement, so as long as it's a publicly available measurement, you can just tune in. Um, we also support uh, replaying of historical events via the streaming API. So if you are into doing visualizations, this is a really cool feature, because what you can do then is they replay the results as they came in, in between 1st of January and 3rd of January, because whatever happened there, it, it illustrates an event. That's really good. We also expose the probe connections. So if, for example, um, a country has connectivity problems, which does happen every now and then, to due to attacks or, or state interaction or something, um, then we can Im immediately give the listeners the, the information that a whole bunch of probes come going down from exactly the same network. So it's not only countries, it, it's ASs, prefixes, whatever you want. Um, Let's see if this works. Yes, it does. Um, I think I showed this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is a real-time visualization of what we see for DNS root servers for internal data. It's basically all the anycast instances of cables that we see on the y-axis, and the x-axis is time. And if you're observing closely, the whole thing is just shifting to the left. So basically, as soon as we have new data, uh, it is shown here. What's more interesting to you and to the general network operator is this one. This is not ENS, this is ping data. Um, this is one of the examples that my colleagues built. Um, basically, this is a measurement running with some probes, I don't know, 50 to 100 or so. And some of them are put into this graph. So you, you have the absolute um, control to, to pick and choose which probes you actually want to graph. Um, in this graph, you see that they are actually uh, grouped by country, so the probes from the US, from Germany, from Switzerland, and so on. And you can also see that as soon as we have the data, they, they just appear on the right hand side, and the whole thing is just shifting to the left. So assume for a moment that, that you are monitoring your own network using just simple things, nothing else. And you are doing that from the five neighboring countries because that's, that's what you do, or your five peers or upstreams. Uh, and you group them by upstream or by country or whatever it is. You can put this on your knock wall if you want, and you will immediately see if there's packet loss, if suddenly the RTTs increase, or so you don't have to do anything. It's just on your screen if you want. Uh, Atlas anchors, I think there are three or four in Finland, uh, one in Tampere, one in Helsinki, and one, uh, I don't exactly know where, but somewhere to the, to the uh, northeast. Um, we have 120 in total, so if you're interested to get more credits than just running an, uh, an average probe, then by all means approach us and uh, we'll hook you up with one. Um, DNS1. Uh, we also rebuilt DNS1, which is a service that monitors TLDs, GTLDs, and some of the CCTLDs, including Lotfi. Um, so that's just built, rebuilt against uh, Atlas. And what you can see here is the finished zone. Um, and I tweaked the parameters, which you can do, uh, such that it actually shows which is which server it is. Um, how should I say, the least stable out of this set. This still means that it's pretty stable, but compared to the other ones, it's not so much. Nice. It, it actually, I think it's C.fi. So whoever operates that might want to take a look at DNS1 and figure out why this is. OK, overall public IP discovery, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But basically, we are running a network where probes could be anywhere on the, on the internet, and we don't even know where they are. So we need to discover what IP addresses they are using, in which networks they are, and so on. Um, we are using a couple of methodologies to actually uh, figure it out. Um, one is when the probe actually connects to us on a secure connection. That's the most trusted. We, we kind of know what the IP addresses that. 
but we also do HTTP measurements. So you, you all know that what's my IP or similar services where you just go to a website and what comes back is an IP address, which is the, the client IP. So we also try to discover that, and it may or may not be the same as the connection address, because if you are behind a transparent proxy um, and you don't even know it, then the system will highlight that, well, it's not exactly the same thing as you're connecting from. So, so that's an interesting one. And we also discovered the local network uh, problem. So. Okay, uh, this is going to be a separate talk. Um, ISP, uh, ISP locality checks, basically using the whole infrastructure, uh, we can now discover if traffic stays local within a country, within a region, does it cross over an IXP or not, um, which is a very interesting topic in itself and it's worth having a separate talk. Uh, Multi-target measurements, some people are interested in using a single vantage point, but doing kind of a fan out measurement, so that single vantage point should try to connect to a whole bunch of uh, targets, which is not really natively supported inside Atlas because that was not the original design goal, but we have a solution for that, so if, if you're interested in this, then you know, talk to me or, or figure this out. Um, we have the documentation up there. Um, as I mentioned, Exposing the information about what we what we think the prototypes uh, are is going is coming real time visualizations, basically the streaming API, the one that I showed you about the pin graphs, but more are in the making. So um, I expect that we will have better support for you guys. If you're really interested in how the world sees your networks, you will have the actual visualizations that help you uh, doing that. And then based on that, more active notifications. Um, Quickie, we had a so-called wrap at hackathon in March. I don't think that should be made, that was in March. Um, That's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't think we will have one tomorrow. Um, anyway, um, this is just an interesting thing. We invited visualization experts to do good stuff with the data that we had. So basically, they came with whatever knowledge they had. We told them, this is the data that we can give you to do magic. And some of them actually did. Um, they, they built real-time visualizations, non-real-time visualizations, enhancements, and so on. This is a really good thing. Um, if you're really interested in the details, then you know, that's the URL. You can, you can uh, go there because that emphasizes an interesting event. On the very first day in the morning, just when people started coming in, there was a massive, massive power outage in Amsterdam, around Amsterdam as well. Um, we claim innocence. It wasn't caused by us. But it, it does, well, it did provide really, really useful data because suddenly these people had access to streaming the information about which roles are active, which went down, which came up. Uh, and this was an event that just really, really impressively stood out from, from the noise. So that was interesting. Okay, risk. Some of you might know, um, for some reason, my Twitter is tweeting. Uh, some of you might know RISC, which is basically a BGP collection infrastructure, which the uh, RIPE NCC has been running since 1999, so basically forever. Um, roughly 12 to 15, depending in, in which point in time, uh, collectors, 6700 peering sessions. Uh, this is basically this is what the system does, and it gives you open data. If you're interested, you can just download the, the feeds that we have, uh, people don't send update messages as well. Uh, we are going to revamp this. We are already in the process of doing that because we really want to scale it up. We want to extend the number of peering sessions. Um, we want to modernize the architecture. And we want, be, and we want to support way more um, use cases, what we call it. So reasons why this data is useful for, um, for the, the world itself, um, operators or researchers or whatever that is. So stay tuned. We are going to do uh, more in this one. The one interesting thing, uh, aspect of that is that we're going to combine the two technologies of streaming data and risk collection. So we are going to expose the data that we get from the peering sessions via streaming API. So if you are interested in getting real-time access to how the world sees BGP at various points in the, in the world in our collectors, then you can start tuning in into the service and you just get the data um, with the appropriate filters that you want. So you can just say, give me all the updates that happened about prefix this or AES that. Now, you can imagine that if you are really trying to tune in to the data about your own group, 
metrics, then this immediately becomes a network monitor or a content monitoring tool, if you will, uh, because you can immediately be notified if someone is advertising your prefix, which is usually not what you want. So just to give you an impression of how this works, this is a very, very bare bone um, visualization of it. Behind this, there is this whole infrastructure of collecting BGP data and streaming it out. So ideally, um, what I get is data. Yeah, you can, what you can see here is, let me move it because otherwise it's not useful. At this point in time, five seconds later than it actually happened on the internet, on the collector, uh, this update was happening in BGP. Okay? Um, if you want to listen to it, there's a standard technology behind it, so it's actually pretty simple. But the power here is that you can say, yes, 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 but I'm only interested in events that are set by a particular peer or set of peers, or relate to a particular prefix, or come from a whatever uh, ASN, or only announcements. So you can imagine uh, the potential behind it. Now, the interesting thing is that we seem to be able to actually do more and less specific searches as well. So if you have, I don't know, a 22, slash 22 somewhere, and someone suddenly advertises a part of it, like a slash 24, you can, you can tell the system, yes, I'm interested in this 22, but also in all of the details. So in all of the more specifics. If someone advertises anything inside that, I don't know. Uh, that, that, that's that an interesting feature. And I think I ran out of slides. Any questions? Okay. I'm around. If you're shy, if you want to approach me. All through the night, right? All through the night. Okay. The, the degree of, of answers will deteriorate over time. <laughs> no. Cool. Uh, well, give a big hand.